So we've been on this building faith journey and uh, we've been really diving in as a church on what it looks like to build faith. We've talked about fasting. We've talked about prayer. And this past weekend, I spent two of my allotted messages, this is my third, but I spent two of my allotted messages talking about hearing God. And this message is so heavy on my heart that we would hear God that I wanted to bring it for the weekend as well and just keep building on what we were doing at uh, winter camp with the students. John chapter 10, verse 27, you wanna build your faith, we must hear God. John 10, 27, Jesus said, my sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. Wow, what a picture. Have you ever thought to yourself, man, I just wish I knew what to do. I wish I knew what God's will was for this decision. I wanna live life with fewer regrets. I wanna make better choices. What if I could hear God? What if I could know what the path is for me? What if I could open the correct doors? Because I know if you're like me, I look back on my life and there's some doors I wish I would have left shut. There's some other doors I wish I would have opened. Hearing God allows us to navigate a world that's full of buzz, that's full of distractions, that's full of competing ideologies. We must hear God and you can hear God. Mark chapter four, verse nine, the Bible says, he who has ears to hear, let him hear. That's from Jesus. Do you know Jesus said that, I believe, 15 times, if I'm correct. 15 times in the New Testament. If you have ears to hear, let you hear. Hear, if you have ears to hear, let you hear. God is saying, I am speaking, are you listening? I'm listening. So how do we hear from God? I love this this incredible picture in John chapter 10, verse 27. It's a picture that's lost for us who live in this kind of environment, but in those days, it would have been a picture that was very, very common, very familiar for them. And it was the picture of the relationship between the shepherd and the sheep. Shepherd and the sheep. In some of my studies, I saw that some of the the shepherding would be a a lot of different sheep all in one place, a lot of different uh, herds all in one place. There would be this massive gathering area. And, And as I studied it, I discovered that one owner of a certain portion of sheep, they would come to call it a thousand sheep. And they would call to their sheep. Maybe they had a hundred and they would call to their sheep, and that hundred sheep would follow the voice of their shepherd. And that's how they would separate. It was purely by the shepherd's voice. And and then as I studied further, when one would wander off, or they wanted to pinpoint one, they would even have certain calls for certain kinds of sheep. And so there was this fine-tuned relationship in that world 2,000 years ago, this fine-tuned relationship between the voice of the shepherd and the ears of the sheep. And we need to learn from that, that God has his voice and he has given us ears. And we want to hear the voice. If you have ears to hear, are you listening? Number one way we can hear the voice of God. Number one way we can know what to do, scripture, scripture. Scripture, the word of God. Second Timothy chapter three, verse 16, all scripture is inspired by God. That word inspired, it means God breathed, okay? Yeah, what a beautiful picture. These words that God's breath went into those words. God's breath. It, it beckons back to the creation account where he formed mankind and he breathed into man life. 
And we know that the Bible says that the word of God is living. It is powerful. It is God breathed. It's not just words on a page. Listen, all kinds of museums have copies of the word of God. But this book is not a museum book. This book is a book between holy God and imperfect people. It is his love letter to us. It is not a mere manual for life. This book is the inspired word of God. And it's the number one way with authority that you hear God. He says it's useful to teach us what is true and to make us realize what is wrong in our lives. It corrects us when we're wrong, teaches us to do what's right, and God uses it to prepare and equip his people to do every good work. What's it saying there? You wanna know what to do? You wanna know what God's will is? Get in the word of God. I love this quote by my hero, one of my heroes, Charles Spurgeon. Charles Spurgeon is a pastor who preached, author. He was a legend in the 1800s in England. He said this, but the Lord speaks to us chiefly through his word. Oh, what converse God has with his people when they are quietly reading their Bibles. There in your still room as you have been reading a chapter, have you not felt as if God spoke those words straight to your heart and then there, then and there? Has not Christ himself said to you while you've been reading his word, let not your heart be troubled? You believe in God, believe also in me. The text does not seem to be like an old letter in a book. Rather, it is like fresh speech, newly spoken from the mouth of the Lord to you. It has been so, dear friends, has it not? What a powerful way to describe it. Hebrews chapter four, verse 12, the Bible says, for the word of God is living. That's what makes it different from Shakespeare. This is what makes it different from, from a, a history book. The word of God is living. It's active. God breathed. It's living. It's active. Sharper than any two-edged sword. Piercing to the division of soul and spirit, of joints and marrow, and discerning the thoughts and intentions of the heart. You hear that last part? God, I want to hear you. God, I want to know what to do next. Discerning the thoughts and intentions of the heart. The word of God soaks your heart and soaks your thoughts. It informs your heart. It informs your thoughts. That's a powerful scripture because elsewhere we learn that the heart is desperately wicked. Who can know it? So if we have broken, messed up hearts that will lead you astray, like, like this whole, oh, I just fell in love. Oh, the heart does what the heart wants. No, sir, no thank you. If you fall in love, would you just trip and fall? If you fall in love, you can fall out of love, right? And some of us have had that hard conversation. Oh, I just fell out of love. I just fell out. Okay, you fell in. I don't know how you fall out. But nevertheless, this heart language, it's so broken, so untrustworthy, we need the word of God to inform our hearts and to equip our thoughts. So the word of God is the number one way that we can know and hear God. Psalm 119, 105, the Bible says, your word is a lamp for my feet and a life for my path. You wanna know what to do next? The word of God. I'm spending some time on this first part because we're about to go into some other stuff. And before we go there, we've got to absolutely settle it. We are a Bible-believing people at Keystone Church. If you're new here today, we base everything on the word of God. And we spend a lot of time with this on the students. I'm not gonna re-preach that message. But I do want to take a second and make sure we're all on the same page, that what it means to be a Bible-believing people is that when my heart and my feelings or the way that I was raised or some strongly held beliefs, even political beliefs or beliefs about relationships, when those beliefs come in conflict with the Word of God, I've made a decision that the Word of God wins. I've made a decision that the word of God wins. And it doesn't matter what the world calls you by following his word. It doesn't matter what label they put on you. Oh, you're just a Bible thumper to the glory of God. 
Oh, you're just a Jesus freak. Amen, hallelujah, I am a Jesus freak. <laughs> Anybody know that song? Yeah. You're, you're, you're not in these first few rows if you know that song. <laughs> I'm, I'm happy to be a Jesus freak. I'm happy to be a Bible thumper because I believe in the word of God. And when, it, when we're in conflict with the word of God, the word of God wins. Some people would say to reach the young generation, we need to tone it down. We need to soften our voice when it comes to the hard truths of the word of God. We need to just preach the, the, love, the love passages. You know, it's easy to preach love one another. It's hard to preach sin and repentance, right? And some people say to reach the young generation, you don't go into those hard in the paint scriptures. But I'm telling you, God is moving in the young generation at Keystone Church, and it's not because we're avoiding the hard scriptures, it's because we're, we're running right into them. And this young generation is desperate for truth. They want truth. And we made a decision. We're not softening, we're bringing no, no less than the word of God and no more than the word of God. How do I hear the word of God? I hear God's voice as it is read, so I read the word of God. I take some time. We talk to the students, and maybe we all need to hear this and remind, hey, just give yourself five minutes. If that's all you got, just give yourself five minutes to just read the word of God, and just give yourself some space. Like, give yourself some space. Maybe it's just reading the verse of the day. By the way, God does some crazy stuff with the verse of the day. Like I was preparing to preach 1 Samuel chapter three, which I'll read in just a minute at the end of my message, and the day before I preached it, guess what the verse of the day was? 1 Samuel chapter three. That's just God, that's crazy stuff. But just give yourself five minutes, if that's all you've got, to read the word of God, say, God, I'm looking for you in scripture, I, I'm asking you to soak this into my heart, I'm asking you, what do I need to do with this? Just give yourself some minutes. It's as it's read, and then as it's preached, as the word of God is preached in this moment, man, we're taking notes, we're writing it down, and I'm saying, man, this is my day of, of, of gathering with the f spiritual family of faith and let the word of God equip me, the word of God. That's how we hear God's word. In addition to scripture, here's a question, does God speak today? So I spent a lot of time on the word of God to get to this question. In addition to scripture, does God speak today? Well, there's two basic extreme camps on this answer. On the one hand, there are those that say, no, God does not speak in addition to scripture today. That what we have is the word of God and the word of God is sufficient. And the truth is, if the word of God was all you had, it is sufficient. It's not a question of sufficiency. But they would say that God speaking to us, speaking to your thoughts, speaking to your hearts, that that ended with kind of the apostles. And it really effectively ended when the Bible was closed with the book of Revelation. When the book of Revelation was closed, then God stopped speaking. And it's a view that's called cessationism. And uh, many good people have believed in that in, in, in the years gone by. Let me go ahead and quickly say that is not the stance of Keystone Church but I do wanna be charitable toward those that hold this view. And, and, and the truth is, they believe the Bible is sufficient and that needs to be our truth, and boy, I, I echo that. The Bible is sufficient and the Bible is our truth. We believe that. And I wanna spend a lot of time on that. I wanna make sure that's in your heart. You heard me say it over and over and over again. But then on the other hand, there's another extreme view, and it's over here where it is biblical malpractice, okay? and it's biblical neglect. So on the overhand over here, on the one hand over here, we say all we have is the Bible, there's nothing else. And then over here, it's kinda like, yeah, the Bible, but I just really want my fresh word. I just want my fresh word, new every morning. God's doing a new thing, and I just want my fresh word. And we're not spending a lot of time in the Bible because that's too easy. We're looking for something a little more feeling. We're looking for something over here a little more emotional. We're looking for something that's a little more mysterious. And it's just a little too pedestrian to just hear what God has to say through the word of God. Again, these are extreme views. And Keystone Church does not subscribe to this view. 
where your personal experience is your authority over the word of God. Did you hear that? So how do we rectify these two? The answer is, does God speak today? Yes, God speaks today. In addition to scripture, but what, however he would speak to you, it never, ever, 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 underline the word ever, this is written in stone, never, ever will your personal word from God trump or contradict what is clearly in scripture. And this is the key. Scripture, thank you five, six people, that's great. <laughs> scripture is authority. Your personal hearing from God and your thoughts hearing from God in your heart, that's not at the same authority as the word of God, okay? Let me give you an example. I went to a Christian college and a very small Christian college to get my bachelor's. And when I went to this small Christian college, man, if you started dating somebody, you were married. I mean, it was just such a small school that if you started dating somebody, they had you married. I mean, it was done. And if you dated one person, this is how girls work if guys don't understand this. Once you dated one girl, the school's so small, you could never date again at that school, <laughs> ever. Like it was over. Because, you know, girlfriends, they just don't date their friends, you know, all that kind of stuff. You can see I was not a fan of this rule. It ruined my life, all right? It worked out, Susan. But anyway, so I am glad for the rule. Okay, okay, okay. But there would be guys who love the Lord, God bless them. But they would say, the Lord told me that you're supposed to be my wife. And they had that crazy look in their eyes. Never mind, she's running out of the room. <laughs> and they did not get married. So we're, you know, did God tell you? Is she living in sin because she didn't marry you? You know, it just doesn't have the same weight. You with me? It doesn't have the same weight. And so there needs to be some humility over here as you're listening to God. We're gonna talk about this and we're gonna, we're gonna unlock this. Here's what it looks like. From reading the Bible, Here's how you do it. From reading the Bible, as you read the Bible, out of that truth, out of that foundation, the more you learn who God is, the more you familiarize yourself with the ways of God, you have set the conditions for God to speak to your thoughts and speak to your heart. Did you hear that? I don't think you did. Because like five of you are like, hey man, the rest of you should have been like throwing towels in the air. I mean, it should have been tambourines and marching Zion, you know? From, that's another small group of people that got that one too. <laughs> but I'm here for everybody, all right? So, from reading scripture, God, I'm reading the Bible. And when I read the Bible, I'm looking for you. By the way, when you read the Bible, you want to look for God first. You second. That'll help you. I just changed your life right there. You look for God first. God, who are you showing me that you are? That's the first. So God, who am I learning who you are? And then God, in reading who you are, am I learning who I am and how you want me to relate with you? And the more you do that, you are setting the condition for your ears to hear and your heart broken that it is because you have Christ redeemed heart that it is to be able to receive and familiarize yourself with an impression that you believe is from the Lord, okay? This is huge, and this will change your life because at Keystone, we, be we are Bible people, but we believe in the rich adventure of God speaking to you every day. But it's from being a Bible person that you're truly equipped to do this. When you're a Bible person, here's what happens. When you're listening to the words of God, you listen with humility. Humility. So, man, I really feel like God's telling me this. I really sense that God's telling me this. I really believe that God's telling me this. I really believe it. I'm, I sense it with all my heart. But I know that I'm broken because I read that in the Bible. 
And I know that sometimes I have competing desires that may be telling me what I wanna hear. So God, I walk into this impression with humility and I test it. I test it. This is, this is so powerful. This is so powerful. Peter Lord, he said this. By the way, over here it's the God spoke to me. I believe God is speaking to me. You would say that. God spoke to me. God spoke to me. Okay. Peter Lord, he wrote a book called Hearing God, and he said, God spoke to me is now a vital part of my spiritual pilgrimage and life, not through an audible voice, but through concrete impressions in my heart and mind. I know God was communicating to me because the words I heard came to pass and the outcomes bore fruit that glorified him. That's good stuff. So I tested it. I, 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 was, I was patient. Um, I understand I can be wrong. I've been wrong before, but I'm trying. And so I am going slow and I'm testing it with scripture and I'm sharing it with some friends. And even if I have a word for someone else, here's what I love about this church. Here's what, I've had people come to me and here's what they say. They'll say, you know, I really do believe that I have a word for you, but I'm, I'm just gonna give this to you and you can test it and you can see if it's for you. The humility of that, the humility of that, whereas I've been in some rooms where people will come up and they'll say, this is God's word for you, and it's so binding, and it's so restrictive, and there's no relationship, and it's just like, it could be tough. Sometimes it's true, but it can be tough. Rather, the humility that says, I really have a strong Scripture for you. When we started Keystone Church, there were some scriptures that were very, very powerful pers personally for Susan and me. And we got with some friends, and this, these friends, boy, they, they love the word of God, and they listen to the voice of God. And they said, hey, we just wanted to spend time with you. You're about to start this church. I know there's a lot going on, and we just can't get over that there's just one scripture that we wanna share with you. Guess what scripture it was? It was Isaiah, it was the exact same scripture. Susan and I, about two years into starting Keystone, we went over to England to see my brother who was getting his PhD over there, little smarty pants, and, uh, and we went over there and, and we went to his church, and this church is a great church in England. God was doing great and mighty things, and there was a prayer time, and we came forward and we began to, to we went forward for prayer because at this point we were trying to just raise enough money to get out of a school and into a furniture store. Some of y'all remember those days. It was incredibly stressful. It was a big leap of faith, and Susan and I were very, very under a lot of weight and a lot of pressure, and we went forward for prayer, and these people from England didn't know our name, didn't know we were Heath, I was Heath's brother, had no clue who we were, came up, began to pray over us so specifically to what we were doing at Keystone Church. It was prophetic, it was personal, it was a holy moment for us that God gifted us. And here I am, over a decade later, sharing it with you. Yeah. What an encouragement. What an encouragement. This is the, the goosebumps part of following Jesus where he'll, like even, I'm, I'm, kid, I'm not kidding you, the other day I've been preparing this message for the students on 1 Samuel 3, and then I have a verse of the day, and it's 1 Samuel 3, and I'm just so childlike in my faith, I assume God's just smiling at me. You know, how about we all be that, that simple? That when God seems to be winking at you, that's what my father-in-law says, oh, that's God winking at you. What a Texas thing to say, right? <laughs> That's God winking at you. When God winks at you, receive it. Receive it, it'll build your faith. It'll encourage you. Out of being anchored in scripture, allow it to encourage you. Here's some scripture to back it up. Revelation 3.20, behold, this is Jesus talking. I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice, my sheep hear my voice, if anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come into him and eat with him and he with me. Revelation 3.20 is not looking back at the, at the, at the, at the scripture in totality, it's looking forward. So here he's talking to us about how to have intimacy with God is hearing him knocking on our hearts, okay? 
So tune your ear to the voice of God, to the knocking of God. First John 4, 1. Beloved, I do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits to see whether they are from God. For many false prophets have gone out into the world. Test it. Discern it. Mark chapter four, verse nine, he said, he who has ears to hear, let him hear. Let him hear. So here's a question. Do you have ears? Do you have ears? I love it. Yes, I do. Yes, pastor, I do have ears. What do I mean here? What is he talking about? He's not talking about these little guys. He's talking about, do you have ears in your heart? That means, number one, do you have a relationship with God? That's how it starts. Who has ears? Are your spiritual ears unclogged and alive to hear God? Have you come to a place in your life where you cross the line of faith, we talk about it every week, and we should, where you have crossed the line of faith and as you cross, you said, I'm in. I'm in, I'm in, I'm in. On the other side of this line, I said, God, I have unbelief, help my unbelief, but there was a moment where you just said, doggone it, I'm in. I'm in. I'm following God and I'm never going back. I'm in, I'm in, I'm in. We had students at the winter camp raise their hand and say, I'm in. I'm in. I'm in. We'll be baptizing this weekend. I'm in. So do you have ears? If you believe that the crucified and risen Christ is the Lord of your life, you have spiritual ears. But do you really want to hear God? Okay? So who has, if you have ears to hear, let him hear. In other words, do you want it? Do you want it? It's like in sports, we talked about this last night. It's like in sports, there's a point when you're a kid and you're just a, a little ding dong running around the soccer field. <laughs> and that's fine when it's participation trophies, right? But there's a point where you gotta decide, I wanna play. I remember there was a point with my son where he had to decide, am I gonna play tackle football or not? He had to decide, do I want to hit? And do I, am I willing to be hit? There's a point in your brain where you start playing tackle football where at first you're a little skittish about it. I've, I've watched it. And there's this thing that switches where you're like, no, I really enjoy this. And it becomes yours. There's a point in a sport where you decide, I want, as a kid, I want to be good at this. And it can't be your mom. I mean, we've dragged our kids to dance lessons and they didn't want to go. We've dragged our kids to these kind of lessons and those kind of lessons. And finally, I just looked at Susan and said, I'm done. I'm done dragging them to stuff they don't want to do. I mean, unless it's like stuff I really want them to do. <laughs> let's keep it real, right? I mean, let's be honest. No, the truth, if I really believe it's good for them and it's, you know, I'll, I'll do that, but, but it's like, hey, I'm not gonna sit here and be more passionate about cheer than you are. I had a daughter, not gonna say her name, Georgia, but, um, <laughs> you know, she did dance all these years and, and, you know, and it was amazing once we started, and then we did cooking lessons. And this girl got passionate about cooking lessons. I mean, she lit up, she's reminding us because it's hers. She got passionate and she can cook, man. So all that to say is there's a point in your faith where it turns on and you decide, I want this. I wanna know the word of God. I wanna know the ways of God. That means you really wanna hear God. So do you have ears? Are you spiritually alive? Do you really wanna hear God? Do you truly desire to have communion with him? Because here it is, communion is what unlocks communication. It's true in every relationship in your life. You're wondering what's wrong with your communication and your marriage. How is your communion with one another? It's a spiritual term. Communion is connection. Communion is connection. You want to hear God, how's your connection? You want, to, you want to be connected with your wife, you need communion with your wife. You need communion with your husband. You need to ask questions. Just little things, like when they walk in and they're having a tough day, don't blow them off, lean in. That's communion. 
communion with God is I wanna read my Bible because I need to know the ways of God. Not because I'm trying to get God's approval because that's not what it's all about. It's because I know that God approves of me and out of that approval, I wanna know this God more. I wanna know him more. So do you want it? Now there can be some distractions. Luke chapter eight, verse 14 tells us about these distractions to hearing God. God, Jesus told a parable and I'm, I'm dipping into the parable. So this, this whole message is like, I told, I told some, some leaders this morning, I said, man, pray for me. I think I was overly ambitious with this message. Like I'm covering way too much ground, you know, but just maybe y'all could just throw a little quick prayer right there. Um, Luke chapter eight, verse 14. And as for what fell among the thorns, he said, they are those who hear, did you hear that? They are those who hear, but as they go on their way, they are choked by the cares and riches and pleasures of life, and their fruit does not mature. As for that in the good soil, they are those who, hearing the word, hold it, want it, hold it fast in an honest and good heart, humble, and bear fruit with patience. So here's the distractions we see here laid out in Luke chapter eight by Jesus. Number one distraction, worry. Number two, riches. And number three, pleasures. These are not the only distractions that can keep you from hearing the word of God, but he said them, I'm gonna just take a second. So worry. Worry, you're so consumed with the problems that you do not take those problems to God. You just marinate on doomsday, you marinate, you catastrophize, you're just marinating on how bad it could be and, and you're just, just revolving around and replaying it over and over and over again and just, let me just be the voice in your week, if that's you, have you prayed about it? Have you laid it at the feet of God? For every one part of worry, you need to reflexively just give three parts to God. You know, you just, that's what we need. Like, you just need to discipline your mind. Whenever I feel gripped with worry, I turn and I give it to God. But worry will choke out. Because what is worry? Worry causes us to look inward. That's what worry is. Worry, you begin to contort your spiritual being into something that looks more like this. You're closed up as opposed to opened up, okay? Riches, nothing wrong with riches. Nothing wrong with riches. But when you are pursuing riches as the end goal of your life, you tend to not hear God. And then pleasure, same thing. God has wired us for pleasure. Good gift, bad God. You're pursuing pleasures, you're not pursuing God. These are examples of some distractions. Here's the danger of being distracted. Zechariah chapter seven, verse 11. But they refused to pay attention and turned a stubborn shoulder and stopped their ears that they might not hear. They made their hearts diamond hard, lest they should hear the law and the words that the Lord of hosts had sent by his spirit through the former prophets. Therefore, great anger came from the Lord of hosts. So hearing God is not just good for you. Not hearing God is bad for you. Because what you're saying is, God, I don't need you. I don't. I don't need your umbrella of, of attention. I don't need your umbrella of anointing. I don't need your umbrella of favor. I got this. That is a dangerous place to be. So what are we gonna do? We're gonna start today. We're gonna start right now. We're gonna start today. First Samuel chapter three, verse 10. Story of a 12, maybe 13 year old, according to Jewish history, 12, maybe 13 year old boy this 12, 13 year old boy had been dedicated to the Lord, right? Had been dedicated to the Lord, young man. And his job was to live in the, in the tabernacle, which was the precursor to the temple. And in the most intimate place in the tabernacle, he was there to tend the fire, clean. He was a caretaker as a young man. And God began to speak to him, Samuel. It jarred him, woke him up. So this was like an audible voice, woke him up. He went to Eli, the aging prophet, priest. He said, sir, did you speak to me? No, that wasn't me, go back to bed. So he went back to bed. Samuel went to Eli, not me, three times. 
Finally, Eli, who had his own problems, Eli turned and he said, and he thought to himself, I think this dude's hearing from the Lord. He was a little slow to get there. I think this dude's hearing from the Lord. And so little Sam, he said to him, he said, all right, here's what I want you to do. Next time you hear Samuel, next time you hear that, I want you to just say, speak, Lord, your servant listens. And that's what happened. And the Lord came and called us before, Samuel, Samuel, this is the fourth time, Samuel, Samuel. And Samuel replied as he was instructed, speak, your servant is listening. May I encourage you today? You may think, man, God speaks to guys like pastors, and Billy Graham kind of people and Mother Teresa kind of people. He speaks to those kind of people, people who memorize all this scripture and know the books of the Bible real well. And maybe God speaks to them, but God doesn't speak to me. But he will speak to a 12 year old boy who it takes four times for him to realize he's hearing from God. So he's hearing imperfectly. He's not tuned in. He's in the right place. He's positioned correctly. He needed a little help, but he heard God. Can I just encourage you? God doesn't speak less to you. God doesn't speak less to you. I want you to consider this. Is it possible that God isn't speaking more to some than others? but rather some are listening more than others. How about we focus on how God speaks to you rather than comparing yourself to others? You might be surprised at how he speaks to you this week. Can we pray together? As we bow our heads and close our eyes, I just wanna offer you something. Hearing God is so personal and you may, you may be bringing some weight into this room that really requires, God, I really need to hear you. I'm at a divide in my path and I cannot miss this. I cannot miss this. The decisions I'm making right now will affect the rest of my life. I need to hear you, God. And you would like somebody to partner with you in hearing God. As we dismiss, we're gonna have pastors and prayer team ready to receive you and pray for you and to help you hear from God. Maybe you would come forward and say, I'm ready to cross the line of faith, I'm in. Come forward, tell them. They'll tell you exactly what it means to be a Christ follower, and they'll help you with that. Father, I pray that we would hear from you as we build our faith. And God, as we wrap up this week of fasting, as we wrap up this week of separating ourselves as a spiritual family, and we head toward Vision Weekend this coming weekend. God, I pray that the fires in our spiritual soul would just be stoked and it would be like this roaring engine burning fuel ready for faith as we come back together for vision sunday and then as we gather the next weekend as we launch a series on the holy spirit super bowl weekend father as all of that happens we pray god that you be doing a great and mighty work some of us we've been fasting and we feel it like that eighth grade girl. I've been embracing new habits and it's changing my life. My life is slowing down and all I needed to do was give God this fast of scrolling. God, what are you doing in our lives? May we, as we fast, as we pray, may we hear you. And in doing so, may we see our world changed forever. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.